Osiris. This podcast is in the loop, the Legion of Osiris podcasts. What does that mean? Osiris is a community of great music and culture podcasts. If you like this one, go check out others at osirispod.com and get in the loop. Osiris is partnered with Relics Magazine at relics.com. Thank you all for coming out. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's conversation on the hopes and challenges of faith and politics. And we have some distinguished guests with us that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, First, I'd like to say that the Center for Christianity and Scholarship and the Duke Program in American Grand Strategy are really pleased to be co-sponsoring our fifth lecture together over the past five years, all uh, examining intersections of faith in the political realm. And tonight, we are especially delighted to be co-hosting this event along with the Road to Now podcast series, which is also recording the event. Um, And the Road to Now is a a series which sets out to explore the history behind important events and outstanding individuals in today's world. Um, We do hope that tonight's moderated discussion will both shed light on some of the deep contention and division that abounds right now in the political and religious realm in America. And maybe even this conversation can offer some pathways of hope. We think as importantly, we hope the conversation and the audience Q&A afterwards will embody thoughtfulness, respect for others, and a presumption of good faith to those with whom we disagree. It seems to be that if there's one thing we can agree on right now, it is that our country is really starved for conversation that embodies these characteristics. And this is a joint effort for all of us in the room tonight. We will all have to exercise perhaps restraint at moments uh, internally and externally with our words. But to help us navigate some of these issues, we do have three special guests. Michael Ware, to the far right, my far right, directed faith outreach for President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. He was also one of the youngest White House staffers in modern American history, serving in the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership during President Obama's first term. There, he led evangelical outreach and helped manage the White House's engagement on religious and values issues, including adoption and anti-human trafficking efforts. After his time working on Obama's two presidential campaigns and in the administration, Michael wrote the book, Reclaiming Hope, Lessons Learned in the Obama White House About the Future of Faith in America. The book discusses Michael's experience as a Christian working in government, There it is. Thank you, Far. The book discusses Michael's experience working as a Christian in government, the faith of the president, and how the president viewed the role of faith in politics. The book also offers a call for Christian engagement in the political realm. We do highly recommend that you get it if you have not read it yet. Currently, Michael writes periodically for The Atlantic, Christianity Today, USA Today, and Relevant Magazine. He serves on the national board of Bethany Christian Services, the nation's largest adoption agency, and holds an honorary position at the University of Birmingham's Cadbury Center for the Public Understanding of Religion. He's also a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum and founder of Public Square Strategies, LLC, a company which helps Christian organizations navigate the 21st century American cultural and political landscape. Far Carlin is the, jo- is the Josiah C. Trent Professor of Medical Humanities in the Trent Center of Bioethics, Humanities, and History of Medicine. He's also co-director of the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School and faculty director of the Arte Initiative. Far is seated on the far left, my far left. At Duke, Far practices palliative medicine and builds conversation with colleagues and students around the moral and spiritual dimensions of medical practice. Far received national attention in a 2015 Washington Post story about an email exchange he had in 2004 with then-State Senator Barack Obama. And in at least one speech as U.S. Senator, and then again at least in one speech as President, Mr. Obama lifted up Far's email as an example of thoughtful, kind disagreement about contentious issues. 
This email exchange is also featured in Michael's book. Finally, the moderator for tonight's conversation is Bob Crawford, bassist and founding member of the Grammy-nominated band, The Avid Brothers. But more importantly, for tonight, Bob is also a deeply Christian thinker and a thinker of history. And it's in that capacity that he is serving as uh, the host and the moderator of tonight's conversation. Bob, along with friend Ben Sawyer, co-created and, and now co-hosts the Road to Now podcast series. And in over 100 episodes, the Road to Now has brought historians, politicians, journalists, artists, and theologians to the table for conversations that illuminate the map that brought us to where we are today. We'll take about 50 minutes to have the moderated conversation, and then we'll open it up for a 20 or so minute Q&A. So please do join me in welcoming Michael Weir, Far Carlin, and Bob Crawford. Thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be here with you guys. I've, uh, I've been living with you guys on YouTube lately. They both have uh, speeches and lectures. I, I encourage everyone after we're done tonight to, uh, you know, I'll be sitting in the bus before we have a show. I'll just watch a 30 minutes of a Far Carlin lecture on bioethics and gets me ready to play. It's, it's great. So highly recommend. Let's we could put Netflix away for just a day. <laughs> a musician, a political consultant, and a medical doctor are on a stage, right? That's how the joke goes. Uh, each is concerned to practice their faith in their field and in the public square. Faith in the public square has been a major issue since before our nation's founding, but it feels particularly so over the past decade. We have a student population whose youth was formed around this, just coming into their capacity to vote. And we have seasoned people of faith who feel that they've been at war around relig religious freedom, both culturally and politically, for a very long time. Many are angry and wounded. Our goal today is to have a conversation that is relative to all, but more so to discuss thorny issues that are important to talk about and to do so in a reasoned way. So uh, let's start with an easy one for both you guys. And it is October, so we'll use the baseball analogy. And Michael, you get the bat first, okay? At the Road to Now podcast, we believe that the individual narrative is tied into the larger historical narrative. Only by understanding both can you understand how we got here. So this is well documented in your book, but what led you to become a political consultant and how did, what role did your faith play in that decision? Well, it's great to be here. Really enjoy uh, the opportunity. So, uh, so yeah, I'll tell a bit, bit of the story and maybe other aspects will, will creep in, in in the midst of our conversation. Um, so I became a Christian when I was 15. Uh, my sister had become a Christian a few years before and uh, had started just uh, like a homing missile, just zeroing in on me. Uh, and I, I couldn't get away from her because we lived together. So, uh, But I was uh, kind of indifferent and really antagonistic towards the faith. Um, so uh, she would try and, you know, read scripture to me and I'd tell her, oh, this is all bunk. You just can't face uh, the harsh truth or reality, you need to read a book every now and then. Uh, uh, and at some point, she invited me to go to her youth group, and um, I went, kind of like a little brother thing. I figured I'd just get some more ammunition to show her how silly all this was, and I went to the youth group, didn't like it all that much, but on my way out, uh, there was a, uh, a guy, a volunteer there handing out uh, little tracts of Romans, just Paul's letter to the Romans, no commentary, no, no nothing, just, just the text. And I took it home and read it, read it again, and uh, it changed my life. 72 hours later, I told my sister when she was dropping me off home uh, that I'd given my life to Christ. Uh, so I was interested in civics before that. I, I loved politics before I loved Jesus. Um, uh, <laughs> And so now I thought, well, now I want to do like the most Christian thing possible, which was like go to seminary, become a pastor, and like it's done. But thankfully I had people around me who were like, 
look around there are Christians who aren't pastors, and you could do that too. Uh, and so I wanted to figure out what it meant to be faithful in public things. So that brought me to George Washington University, where in a happenstance kind of situation, um, I met Senator Barack Obama in uh, in the lobby of a hotel when I was leaving, and he was arriving uh, about uh, just a couple days before he would officially announce he was running for president. Told him I wanted to work for him because I had seen his 2004 speech, which was given less than a year after I became a Christian, where he said that we serve an awesome God and we worship an awesome God in the blue states and talked about the idea that I am my brother's keeper. Um, and uh, 10 months later, I was in Iowa uh, working on this campaign. And that happened and we won. Uh, so went to serve in the White House where I helped the president navigate religious and cultural issues and relationships. And then he asked me to run faith outreach for the reelect. Um, but it was really came out of this. I mean, I mean, I guess part of since, since we're, you know, given the context of your, your podcast, you know, I came to faith at a time when so many of the conversations that are conventional wisdom now about the religious right and the conflation of faith and politics. Um, those were big issues in 2003, 2004 as well. It was kind of the apex thought to be the apex of the religious right, uh, religious disaffiliation was already happening. And so part of my coming to faith was also coming to terms with some of those dynamics. And so my pursuing sort of public, the public square was uh, trying to figure out what that meant for my faith. That is working now. Um, well, I grew up in a, in a home where we were uh, my parents uh, taught us from uh, from the earliest age that the central your central vocation is to to know and love God and uh, respond to Him, and I found that persuasive in the example of their lives and as I grew in the in the example of the people's lives I saw who who um, who were formed to to follow Jesus Christ. So I went into college and medical school with a strong, uh, with a clear conviction that whatever I did, it needed to be something that responded to my overall vocation as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to be a doctor, in part because my father was a doctor and my grandfather was a doctor, in part because it seemed like I had a disposition for it. But I certainly wanted to practice medicine in a way that dovetailed with... um, my uh, primary calling to love God and to love my neighbor. And it seemed like medicine was a, a, a way of, it was a kind of work that fit well with that. I knew that Christians had always um, had high regard for the healing arts, um, not least of, because our Lord made healing uh, the, dis- the kind of most prominent way he showed his, the power of his, of his, uh, of his kingdom. Um, so that, it always seemed to me that the practice of medicine was going to surely make sense in light of Christian faith. I want to stay here for just one second, and I want to know how each of you uh, experience your faith while you're working in your realm, right? Um, you're a palliative care doctor. Yes. Uh, I unfortunately know what that is. Um, and that's a really, uh, my, my daughter... Uh, had a brain tumor, and she's treated at St. Jude Children's Research Research Hospital in Memphis, um, and she's doing very well. She's five years on, and uh, but we know a lot of families who've uh, who've lost children, and th- one of the greatest fears as a father of a child with a critical condition is getting that pamphlet that well you're going to go you're going to meet the palliative care doctor. So, given your faith, uh, what led you to choose that arm of medicine? Um, I chose that um, for reasons that I won't go into in detail, except to say that it seemed to me that palliative medicine um, is done well, um, a form of medicine that can be um, uh, medicine at its heart, which is attending to those who are sick, seeking to use the measures that are reasonably available 
to um, preserve and restore the measure of health that's available to them without the pretense to solving the problem of human mortality. Um, medicine today, modern medicine, is so powerful and it's caught up in the whole aspiration of a broken world, as you'd expect, that, uh, that medicine gets made the means of, of getting out of life alive and the means of dealing with all of our anxieties about our mortality. When you work in hospice or palliative care, at least particularly in hospice, the pretense is gone of getting out of this alive. And that, that makes it, to me, a really um, an environment that I really enjoy because I can just focus in on the limited things that we can do um, and uh, without, uh, without running from the fact that the person's dying. And for you, practicing your faith in, we think about the world of politics. It's, I mean, sometimes I can't even in my head put Christianity and politics in the same sentence because it seems like it, politics just pollutes the faith in a lot of ways. What issues have you dealt with and, and how have you dealt with uh, being a man of faith in, in the political world? Yeah, I, would, I would think uh, there are some people in the audience who, who uh, yeah, I would think there are some people in the audience who might be thinking that it's faith that pollutes politics. So, uh, so, so, uh, yeah, it's definitely been a fraught area. Um, you, you know, for, for me in my role, uh, well, let me let me say this first. I always have people coming up to me. You know, how how did you do it? Politics is so uniquely, you know, corrupting. And you know, I, I often try and remind them. Uh, I'll often ask these people, well, what field are you in? And they'll, oh, I'm in finance. Or, you know, you know I'm a, it's one of the great things about being on a panel with uh, Farr, because he just raised some really significant ethical issues that doctors go through. Um, and so uh, politics, I have not found it. I think that there are uh, aspects of politics uh, that are unique, that invoke questions of faithfulness. But politics is not, in my experience, uniquely corrupting. I think all Christians... Uh, in any vocation, need to be thinking about what faithfulness looks like in their vocation. And I had to do the same. Uh, I have been helped by the, by the fact that, you know, I wasn't just in the communications office or in uh, small business administration. Uh, my job was to work with the faith community. And so, so much of my job was meeting with uh, clergy and uh, religious uh, social service agencies that were, uh, you know, serving the needy and, and helping those who needed help. And so um, there was a bit of a protective element where uh, I, I wasn't, even if I wanted to, which I didn't, I wasn't able to forget about faith in the middle of my workday because it was just such a part of it. I had more people praying with me during the workday than ever in my life. Uh, and so... But in, in your book, you talk about uh, you were almost in your own silo in a lot of ways, right? Because you were dealing with... Uh, other people in the administration that weren't of faith and maybe didn't look at your department the same way you did or the issues that you were trying to promote the same way you well, did? You know, I, I, I tell a couple stories to hit on that note, but there were also a lot of colleagues. I mean, so I was a part of a faith, of faith-based initiative, which not everyone who works for the faith-based initiative uh, is a person of faith, but it, it tends to tends to draw people who are. And so, you know, there were a lot of people I worked with who were who were believers, but Certainly, had the question of anyone working in any secular environment has to has to um, navigate the challenges of being driven by a motivation that isn't shared by everyone that they're working with. That's part of what you know being in a, in a pluralistic society looks like. And so, definitely had to navigate those challenges. I was talking with Far before we started. One thing it actually helped me do was both the busyness and the structure of working in the White House and on a on a very um, intense campaign experience um, was actually help me to structure my spiritual life more. So unlike, you know, when I was in college or frankly, even, even now, when I was at the White House, I knew, you know, if I don't read scripture on my metro ride into, uh, down to 1600 Pennsylvania, uh, I'm not going to have time. Like there's not a lunch break where I'm going to be able to like pick that back up. And so I actually experienced, um, uh, working in, in politics was actually a time of great sort of spiritual, uh, replenishment and rejuvenation for me. <laughs> Far, you're actually a character in Michael's book. 
Uh, you, you show up a few times. Uh, you were an early supporter of Barack Obama. And as we talked about uh, earlier tonight, you exchanged an email with him when he was a state senator. However, years later, after he was president, you, after he was out of office, you were quoted as saying, eight years after Obama's election, people of faith feel less free to live out their faith when those te teachings run counter to modern mores. Will you, will you say more on that? Sure. Um, I'll just point to something as visible as the Masterpiece Cake Shop. That's the cake shop in Colorado where the person who makes design custom cakes would not design a custom cake to celebrate the marriage of two men uh, because he is a Christian believing the traditional sexual ethic of Christians um, thought to do so would be to cooperate in something that wasn't true. And so he was taken to court as violating uh, Colorado civil rights. Um, the Supreme Court has just recently sided with him, but on a, something of a technicality. And within days, the same groups had gone back to essentially file another lawsuit again, take, and he's back in court. Um, they're trying to drive him out of business. Um, and a series of decisions by President Obama and his administration, um, uh, which we might talk about in more detail, but Hosanna Tabor was a Supreme Court case where his administration argued that a church should not be allowed to fire an employee who taught in their school because she was uh, publicly living as a lesbian, despite their teaching that that, was, that contradicted their sexual ethic. And the Supreme Court went against his administration 9-0. But then his support for gay marriage, which led to the Obergefell decision um, and the increasingly ratcheting up rhetoric of uh, religious freedom being in opposition to respect for people who are homosexual, um, now respect for people who are transgender, um, has meant that there is now less scope in, uh, uh, in public and in law to, um, to make a public, to act publicly in a way that suggests that the traditional Christian uh, teaching about sexuality is true. Um, and I, I put, not all by any means, but a substantial portion of the blame uh, at the feet of President Obama and the choices he made in the office. We live in a pluralistic society. So, Michael, I'm going to yeah. ask you to respond okay. to Far because you know, this is what I hope we can do tonight is, is talk about these issues and, and at least amongst ourselves come up with what does the right policy look like? Yeah. What is the policy that honors someone's um, personal uh, faith, their, their personal beliefs? H how, how do we, you know, uh, and then with someone's right to, you know, have a cake made, yeah. um, how do we honor everyone's, how does everyone get what they, they need? Yeah. So, right. So, I mean, there's so much to say here, and uh, hopefully we'll dig into it both in the conversation time we have and the Q&A. Um, I'd say a few things. So, I think far is, far is right. A, a major part of the, the, the road to this moment was that a pressure was building up over the course of the term of uh, the Obama presidency uh, that the Obama administration didn't effecti uh, effectively or adequately address and that the Clinton campaign didn't acknowledge at all. And it was only sort of, um, that pressure was going to be let out somehow. That pressure had to find a way to express itself because that's what built up pressure does. Um, I, I will say though, you know, it's a mixture of the rational, like looking at something like the Hosanna Tabor case, and the irrational. Um, and the fact that Democrats didn't adequately address it meant that both the rational and the irrational went uh, went uh, uncontested. So for instance, there are real concerns about Hosanna Tabor, for instance, or uh, the uh, durability and sustainability of conscience clause, clauses for medical professionals. But then there are also the people who think that because Trump got elected means that they now have freedom to say Merry Christmas that they didn't have when Barack Obama was president. 
And so, and, and so, you know, there have been these interviews with folks, and yeah, they're all anecdotal, but, you know, what freedom do you have now that you didn't have before? Well, now I can say Merry Christmas whenever I want. So, you know, it, it takes on a sort of cultural force that is grounded, yes, in some substantive differences, but then also in a whole lot of political uh, and cultural manipulation that goes on. Um, and so, uh, you know, the... the I have entire chapters in my book about the HHS mandate, which I address as, which maybe we'll, we'll get to, which I address as uh, a particular moment where, uh, in the end, uh, the administration, unfortunately, uh, made a decision that was uh, going to exacerbate conflict rather than seek resolution. And it was an unnecessary one. This is the contraceptive mandate. Contraceptive right. mandate. So you write in your book that um, uh, the, contra- the proposed contraceptive mandate amounted to the government's endorsement of utilitarian, demoralized sexual ethic, uh, a message that would separate sex from marriage and procreation and treated sex as simply as a recreational activity that required risk man- management. That, that's my that's my uh, description of the conservative case against it. Yeah, the, the, that's the context but, for that. But you go on to talk about how, oh, I guess President Obama and Vice President Biden, uh, the way that I read it, they they weren't really into the mandate. They didn't, but they felt a lot of pressure. <laughs> it's it's complicated. Uh, there was a significant internal disagreement within the White House on this. Uh, Vice President Biden actually urged. A different path forward, which is actually eventually the path we took, um, uh, or close closer to the path we took. I mean, but look, at great political cost. Well, let, let, me, so let me walk. Sure. Let, let me walk people through this, okay? <laughs> if, if if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one thing that's important to, uh, one reason why I was so. Uh, well, it was so critical and such a big mistake that these issues weren't confronted and talked about more openly and instead resulted into slogans like war on religion and war on women, uh, is that it actually helped religious people, religious conservatives, to feel like there were people waking up in the Obama administration every morning wondering, how do I destroy the church today? <laughs> and, and that just wasn't happening. One thing we have to acknowledge is that we... Sometimes these policy fights aren't purely fights of good and evil. <laughs> like sometimes, like there were people in the Obama administration, and, and the, the motive behind the HHS mandate decision was not how do we restrict religious freedom today. It was how do we expand access to contraception. Now, you could disagree with uh, expanding access to contraception and how they did it, but that's a, that's a policy debate to be had that is not on the terms of... Uh, well, those folks are out to get religion, and we're protecting it. It's a it's a whole different whole different issue. And so uh, then you could have a then you could have a conversation about well, what's the proper balance here? So that that's what the Supreme Court did. They invoked the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which proposes a balance for how the government ought to decide uh, whether their interests justifies an encroachment on the religious freedom of institutions. And the Supreme Court basically said. The government didn't try hard enough to both advance their interests while respecting re- the religious freedom of institutions. That's what I was arguing internally. Uh, that's what the Supreme Court ruled. It resulted in over a dozen revisions to the administration's initial uh, initial decision, um, and it was it was a big mess. It, it meant that the Catholic Church could launch uh, a multi-year uh, cross uh, uh, cross all of their churches. Uh, something they called the Fortnite for Freedom. It meant that it validated, because there was a sincere religious freedom claim, ended up validating all of the irrational religious freedom fears. So what happens when you actually do things like argue against the ministerial exception in Hosanna Tabor, uh, and when you enforce HHS mandate that the Supreme Court says is an infringement on religious freedom, it actually... Uh, help support those who are saying Obama's trying to end prayer in America and all, all this stuff, and it all gets conflated together. And again, the administration didn't do enough, especially in the second term. And then, of course, Hillary Clinton, uh, they didn't show enough interest in advancing a positive, uh, the, a positive case for religious freedom from a democratic perspective. Far, uh, in res- 
I'd like you to respond to some of this because what I, I really I want to hear practical policy proposals, like compassionate policy proposals that honor someone's religious freedom and it honors someone's secular decision making for lack of a and it could be gender transition it could be uh gay marriage it, it, it could be uh contraception it all seems to fall into the same it's all a similar theme right yeah yeah so i i teach at duke university so you won't get any practical proposals um, he's been waiting to say that all night <laughs> If you want to pack a proposal, you came to the wrong town at the wrong time. I I will say this, though. Um, Even the way you phrased the question, I think, uh, hints at a a central archetypal disagreement here um, uh, that, and that is this, uh, you, you asked, how do you honor people's personal beliefs? The president talked about personal beliefs. Reading your book, I was struck again by that language. Mm-hmm. The whole idea of personal beliefs um, dovetails with a very secular notion that's really uh, at the heart of the kind of ideology of liberalism, at least in the forms it's taken in the last uh, couple generations, in which religion belongs in the private sphere. That's right. And believe what you want. You know, the government's not going to impose what you believe, but the government has authority that's primary and primal to, do, to impose on you how you will act. And it can carve out for you in its generosity of spirit, maybe an exception or two here, like for <laughs> ministers, but that's, it has no obligation to do so. And I think what happened over the course of administration is it dawned on me in successive waves when President Obama evacuated the conscience clause that President Bush's administration had put in for healthcare practitioners, um, and just sort of let that die, when he stopped even big, even trying his administration to enforce the rules under the Hyde Amendment about not people not being pressured to participate in abortion or other practices, when he um, did ne- never supported a single abortion restriction despite saying he would, yeah. when he. Uh, compelled uh, every institution that has employees to provide for contraceptive services, which I remember sitting there looking at this thinking, have we ever had a presidential administration that has said, in effect, you will make yourself complicit in a practice that the Catholic Church has taught forever um, is intrinsically immoral? Have we ever had a president do that? And I couldn't think of one. Perhaps we have. I mean... um, but it seemed it was, it was striking to me, and then later with the the policies on uh, uh, gender transition, where it, it seemed to extend to saying something that's being said widely across the profession of medicine now, you can have your personal beliefs about what good medicine is, but you will come on board and practice in a way that agrees with the most progressive vision for what medicine is about, or else you're going to be threatened with the power of the state. That was, this whole idea of the personal being the only space for the religious is something that Christians just can't, we certainly can't agree with. We can live under, because Christians have to live under any kind Mm -hmm. of polity, including Mm -hmm. ones of persecution. And we're not very persecuted right now. Um, But we can't agree that that there's a space for the personal and then there's the professional life. Um, If Jesus, if the story about Jesus is true, there's one reality over which he is the Lord. And... um, uh, in every aspect of our lives uh, is called to account um, in light of who he is. So, so this seems to be a good time to bring this up. On Saturday, uh, Dr. Timothy Keller uh, had an op-ed in the New York Times, and it's entitled, How Do Christians Fit Into the Two-Party System? They Don't. And a, a couple, I just pulled out a couple of the quotes from, the, from it. Um, Believers should not identify the Christian church with a political party as the only Christian one. Political positions are not matters of biblical command, but practical wisdom. Thoughtful Christians, all trying to obey God's call, could reasonably appear at different places on the political spectrum. 
He uh, quotes James Mumford, who is an ethicist, uh, who coined a, a phrase, package deal ethics. You can't work, to get work together on one issue unless you agree on all issues. And then finally, Christians are pushed towards two main options. One is to withdraw and try to be apolitical. The second is to assimilate and fully adopt one party's whole package in order to have your place at the table. Far, to me, it sounds like you're saying there, there's the kingdom of God and then there's the kingdom of man and the two really can't fit together. Because if you're living in, you're trying to live the kingdom, there are certain uh, issues that are not negotiable. But yet, it sounds like we're moving t- uh, to a, a place where Christians won't want to be doctors. Because then they can't, they can't live their faith being a medical doctor because they'll be forced to do things that, that, they, that goes against their beliefs. Is, is there any neutral ground? Is there any way Christians can be true to, the, to God and, and still uh, be contributing uh, and loving their neighbors um, in, in, in America in 2018? Yeah, yes, there is. They just, one way they can't do it is by, they can't do it reasonably and can't do it except by embracing a heresy, is to think of their personal life as the place of their Christianity and the public life as the place of this, where secular reason is to hold sway. That's true. Now, Christians live, you know, Christians have lived under Nero, um, and they've lived, uh, they're currently living in regimes where they uh, face, you know, severe um, penalties for being Christians and practicing as Christians. That's not true in the States. Um, but Christians have, there's a long tradition and long thought about living in the world, including right there in the New Testament, where Christians are being persecuted and seeking the good of the people and being peaceable and not causing, not fighting and causing trouble unnecessarily. So I think in our world, there's, there's plenty of space for that, but it's, it's the wisdom to discern how to contend for the truth, recognizing people don't all agree with you, recognizing that there are people of goodwill have sincere disputes, recognizing that it's only by the grace of God that any of us sees clearly. And we don't even know if when we think we're seeing by the grace of God, we in fact are uh, with perfect assurance. I was thinking about the package deal, and this maybe leads to a question for you, Michael, is it struck me reading your book and and reflecting again on on President Obama, who I always felt like, hey, we exchanged an email. We got something going here, you know, we're close. uh, and I would love to one day sit down with him, which I'm sure I'll, I'll not have the chance to do. But um, it struck me that he was very, very much a liberal Christian, liberal theology here, in the sense that uh, this is, I think, characteristics of liberal theologies in Christianity, in that he did not take the church as a tradition, as a kind of orthodox, uh, authoritative community, as a package deal. Um, He took the church, and this is very characteristic of lots of different versions of Christianity today, and kind of took apart the pieces that he thought were, uh, you know, fit things he cared about, and something like the sexual ethics of the church um, was uh, was to be left behind, and that was that's something that he was you know he's baptized in the United Church of Christ. Um, I reading your book made me wonder uh, what would it have been like if he'd been baptized in an Assemblies of God church on the south side of Chicago? And there's one right there, big one, um, or a Catholic church. Uh, how history, this, the history of his administration might have been different. But um, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, so that's not what, uh, what you're uh, appropriating the phrase package deal to is very different from what yeah. the question was about. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about both. Uh, first, on practical solutions, I'll give you one example, which is uh, Senator Cory Gardner, who's now the senator from Colorado, was in a race against Mark Udall in 2014, I believe. And Mark Udall uh, tried to hold uh, 
Gardner's feet to the fire on his opposition to the HHS mandate, saying that he opposed women and all this stuff. And uh, he did it so much that the Denver Post called him, uh, instead of Mark Udall, like uh, Senator Udall, they called him Senator Uterus because he was talking about the issue so much. Cory Gardner, instead of, instead of feeding into that narrative, uh, Cory Gardner actually uh, wrote a bill um, that would provide contraception over the counter. He said, he said you could do this without involving religious providers at all. Just make it uh, over the counter. And it diffused Udall's argument right off the bat. I'm working on uh, legislation right now uh, with a coalition of both uh, evangelical groups and, um, and LGBT groups that would uh, provide basic uh, civil rights in the areas of housing, education, uh, jury duty, uh, credit, uh, and several others, basically the buckets covered by the Equality Act, which is the sort of signature civil rights legislation advanced by Democrats right now, uh, but in a way that allows for religious freedom, that says that actually uh, we could, uh, kind of similar to the legislation that happened in Utah. Uh, now the problem is that the political capital for these kinds of solutions is not in abundance. And the reason for that is it's very, difficult to fundraise off of, uh, you know, actually, there's a, there's a way that everyone can be happy. It's much easier to fundraise off of the other side hates you, and if we don't win, you're going to be written out of the history books. Um, so there are people thinking about these kinds of solutions. I think um, the partnership that we saw on Friday between Senator Chris Coons, who is a Yale Div grad, who's a Christian, a Democrat, and Senator Jeff Flake is one of those examples of faith-motivating practical, public service oriented uh, 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 agreement. And so I think that these practical solutions are out there. Um, what, what is needed to bring them to the fore is uh, a citizenry, voters who are willing to reward it. And that's the major problem we have in our politics right now is that for all the people who talk about wanting compromise, they actually want the other side to compromise and for their side to remain quote unquote pure. And that's just not how uh, it's going to work if we're going to get there. We're all going to have to be willing to be in conversation with one another. Uh, so uh, covered that. Let me quickly cover um, the idea of package deal ethics. And it, Tim, so Tim is a big C.S. Lewis guy. Uh, uh, Tim Keller, who wrote the op-ed, he's, he's pulling there, I would imagine, <laughs> from a, a C.S. Lewis essay ca uh, called Meditations on the Third Commandment. And there, Lewis is contemplating the creation of a, uh, a Christian third party in Britain. And the, the basic synopsis of this pretty brief, lesser-known C.S. Lewis essay, although I called it I was giving a talk at Cambridge, and I called this essay lesser known, and they're like, there are no lesser known C.S. Lewis essays at Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Lewis says, and I'm paraphrasing uh, a bit here, he says, the greatest temptation when Christians combine faith and politics is to proclaim God hath said where God has not spoken at all. That what happens if you create a Christian political party is that you're actually putting the stamp of Christian dogma on something that is actually a prudential policy decision upon which Christians can disagree. So I think that's very much what Tim is getting to there, that the Christian uh, ethic transcends the confines of political party platforms, which, by the way, change all the time. So if you think that right. your party has finally figured it out and this platform is the right one, uh, just wait four years and... <laughs> There are going to be some flip-flops on at least a few key issues. And so, so I affirm what, what Tim wrote. Uh, regard, you know, I'm happy to get into, I, I prayed with President Obama. Um, I, I've seen him in private and public functions. I, I write a bit about his faith uh, in the book. I, you know, I'm not sure how fruitful it is for me um, to talk about the president's, you know, personal faith decisions. Uh, what, I, what I will say is... Um, I, I think it's, uh, I, I, this was one of the toughest chapters to write in my book, which is in 2008 at Saddleback, sitting across from Rick Warren, he was asked about same-sex marriage. And he said, I don't support it. I believe God is in the mix. Four years later, when he's sitting down with Robin and Roberts, uh, and this wasn't the first answer he gave as to how he, how he made the, the switch 
uh, but down in the interview, uh, Robin Roberts asked how wh what the First Lady was thinking about it, and the President said, you know, we, we've talked about it, and, um, you know, we, we're, we're Christians, and we believe, um, we believe in treating others as you would want to be treated yourself, and that's part of why we think this is the right move. And, you know, the question has always been for me, and I, I say this in the book, is um, that's, that's not a new scripture. <laughs> the golden rule is not new. And so what transpired that uh, would lead you to one, just and people could change on their views, but um, what I write in the book is actually an appeal to the golden rule was a part of messaging guidance that the human rights campaign had delivered as an effective way to persuade people on the issue. And so there is that sort of, that, that fundamental tension, if God was in the mix before, where, where, is, where is God when you, when you make the switch? Um, I, I will say though, he also did something very important in that interview that I don't think was carried over by staff and eventually in some of the rhetoric that was used later into the second term, which was he specifically made note of the fact that he had a lot of pastors and people around him who disagreed and that they weren't bigots and that he respected their view and thought that their view deserved to be heard. And I thought that could have been precedent setting in how we negotiate these fraught areas. But uh, in the heat of our political moment, those kinds of caveats and uh, grace givings um, are fewer and farther between. They certainly weren't there in 2016 on either side. And, and that's a that's a significant loss. And the last thing I note there um, is it's not just a loss for comedy. It's not just a loss for civility. I'm not talking about we all need to be nice with one another. Uh, we are now years removed from Obergefell, and an LGBT person could still be get married on Sunday and be fired from their job, not at a religious organization, at Walmart on Monday. Like, we Democrats have, have been elections, uh, we had a Democratic president for years after o Obergefell, and we still don't have basic federal workplace protections. Well, why is that? It's in large part due to Republican intransigence and opposition to LGBT rights, but it's also because after the uh, Employment Non-Discrimination Act passed in, I believe, 2013 with a religious exemption in it, Democrats actually took the religious exemption out because they thought that they could get it without the religious exemption. So they were willing to play hardball, when I think if you kept that religious exemption in, you'd have an Employment Non-Discrimination Act right now. So both sides need to have their feet held to the fire for not uh, doing everything they can to recognize the dignity and the, uh, the interests of people who may not ever vote for them, may not ever support them. But we can't have a, a, a mutual uh, a government that serves everybody if we're not doing that. Um, just to affirm that clearly, uh, the you know, Christian Christianity transcends uh, politics, and I think this moment, um, our current president, um, you know, hopefully makes that clear. Um, that that it seems to me um, self-evident that a Christian should. Um, know that there's some trouble in being fully uh, behind uh, President Trump and his policies, even if they might have prudential reasons for voting for President Trump and, and voting a straight ticket out of, you know, other concerns. Um, so that's, that's crucial. And, and looking to, to, to respect those with whom we have deep disagreements uh, and seek to put ourselves in their shoes and imagine what it would be like to be on the other side is, is a practice that, that we all must do. But I, I will just close uh, somewhat belligerently perhaps by coming back to that personal professional distinction and the, the golden rule, because I think it's the golden rule um, uh, does not work um, in the, I, in my judgment, in the Christian ethic, unless it's premised on an understanding of taking as for granted the truth of what God has revealed about the world, what we can know about the world, what, what reason requires of us. And I think part of the, so when you invoke the golden rule to mean 
that what we all want is for other people to affirm what we want and to help us get it, that makes a that makes it not a Christian rule. It's not about us. It's about God. It's it's about us in light of the truth about who we are and what is genuinely part of our flourishing in light of what God has revealed about God. You know who God is, um, most decisively in Christ, but throughout the the, the story of God's people as well. Uh, Michael, in your book, you talk about uh, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the people of God living in exile. Because I think it's rel- relevant to what Farr is saying. Yeah, well, so, uh, listen, when I'm talking to Democrats and sort of progressive audiences, uh, I, I highlight the sense that Democrats haven't been speaking to the legitimate concerns of religious conservatives about their space, uh, uh, their place in the public square. When I'm talking with uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about um, Jeremiah's message to the exiles is incredible. These people, you know, there's a lot of Christian rhetoric now about, oh, we're living in Babylon. He's talking to people literally in Babylon. Like, it's not a metaphor. It's not a metaphor anymore. Uh, These people, God's people, found themselves in a land that was not their own among a people who despised them. And yet God's guidance to them, unlike some of the guidance coming from some political figures who appeal to them, was not to sort of uh, impose their will upon the land and sort of hunker down and, uh, you know, kind of beat others into submission. No, it was instead uh, the, the admonition is to seek the peace and welfare of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. It's an amazing commandment. And, and it shows that, you know, for, for, for a, a Christian politics is not about, um, Christianity has this amazing way of abolishing tribes and abolishing sort of these boundaries that we put up. That's what the promise of Revelation promises. Um, and if a Christian's politics are not intended toward the good of their enemies, then it's not a Christian politics. And I get very concerned when I hear Christians who um, say that their faith is in uh, Jesus Christ, the one who, uh, the, the, the Lord of the 23rd Psalm, and yet operate out of uh, such a spirit of fear and embattlement when um, D- Dallas Willard uh, is a, was a philosophy professor at USC and uh, Christian, he, he, he defines joy as a pervasive and constant sense of well-being. He had all these amazing little definitions for words. Uh, over the last three years, I've been going to events, and I'll ask people, how many of you would describe our public discourse as full of a pervasive and constant sense of well-being? And it's a laugh line. Like, of course not. But for Christians, I ask them, what does that answer say about us? If our, if our public witness is full of fear and anxiety. What does that testify about the God we serve? And so all of these concerns are very real, but I just, um, Democrats have a responsibility uh, to treat the concerns seriously. I think to, in my view, make some serious policy changes. Um, But uh, this sense of fear and, and embattlement did not justify a vote for Donald Trump. Not, not in my view, and I'm willing. I think that's a prudential argument. I'm willing to make that. I don't think uh, people who voted for Donald Trump were. Uh, I don't think it was a sin. I think it's offensive to God to claim a vote in an election was a sin. But I, I do. I don't want to prop up sort of the view like, well, Hillary Clinton, you know, would have really been out to get us, so we had no other. No, you had you had a choice. Um, you you just didn't want to. You just didn't want to make it uh, because of what you count the cost for yourself and your tribe to be. That's a, and that's a, serious, that's a serious thing for, for Christians to wrestle with. And again, people may come out to different, different outcomes. I think there's a good argument that religious freedom is a common good issue, that actually when people are free to follow their faith, it's, it's a matter of the common good. But I'll tell you, I don't know how many of the folks who are going to the polls supporting religious freedom were going in the polls with, oh, it, I really hope that we support religious freedom so my Muslim brothers and sisters have the, have the freedom to worship. Like, we know that's not the case because the same people protesting uh, uh, the Obama administration 
um, religious freedom were the same ones protesting the mosque opening up down the street, you know? And so there's this, there's this real complex uh, thing going on and fear and embattlement is driving a lot of it. How much time we got? Last question. No, I just I agree. I mean, if we're if we're motivated by fear, we know something's gone badly wrong. Right. And, yeah. You know, love drives out fear. That's or, exactly. uh, the Holy Spirit is not animating fear in us. Mm. Um, uh, and certainly, uh, if the Christian community is known for protecting itself uh, rather than for reaching out to, to for one's neighbors, that's a problem. Mm. That being said. You know, we, to care for one's neighbor calls into question what is the good of one's neighbor. That's right. And insofar as people equate what the neighbor wants is their good, yeah. which is the central Absolutely. idea of liberalism, um, then then Christians will be perceived in contending with, for their good. And I see this in medicine. If I contend for the good of my patient in a way that disagrees with what they want, culturally now that's perceived as I am using power over them, against them. I don't love my neighbor. Right. I'm not following the golden rule. Yeah, right. And I, you know, I think that's where there really is a tension that ultimately is hard to hard to resolve in some of these cases. We're not going to get any answers out of this, are we? <laughs> None. Partial answers. Well, uh, we haven't brought up. There's. I, I just kind of want. I wouldn't mind y'all's take on the current administration. Mm. Really quick. And then I have an important question. <laughs> but uh, you've already kind of done it, I feel like. Uh, but then you I got a lot more. Respond. No, but no. Okay, so you have that. It's almost cliche yeah. now. 80% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump for whatever reason. Yeah. Hillary Clinton was a terrible candidate. Uh, Donald Trump, he was the Republican on the ballot. You know, for, and then to the reasons that, that you kind of mentioned. But where do you see the religious freedom battle uh, situation under Trump compared to under Obama? Are, are in, in your, maybe you don't like his behavior, how he carries himself, maybe you don't, I don't know, Far, you, you, why don't you just tell us what you think of him? But, but um, You're doing a pretty good job of it, though. I think we might as well. I'm, so I'm projecting. He's not, he's not an exemplar of the Christian sexual ethic. Uh, right. Uh, That's right. By his own admission, uh, his, his own brag. Um, but, uh, but is he like one of these secular leaders from the Old Testament? Maybe, um, what's his name? Uh, Jehu. <laughs> um, who ended up being incorporated into God's sovereign purposes in the people of Israel, but not as a, not because of his righteousness. Um, so, uh, you know, I, President Trump, I, I more or less, if you listen to David Brooks, you get more or less mm -hmm. the, the way I can see it, which is I think he's, he's done, he's done in his administration, has done some things that have been uh, commendable. Um, he is himself um, deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think many of his policies, I think his hostility to immigrants is for Christians something that we should resist and... Uh, forcefully, um, um, his tenor of kind of uh, hmm. mocking, disparaging, and so on is obviously something Christians should uh, resist. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, there's there there on the religious freedom, it, it's better uh, than under President Obama. Uh, uh, although, if you're Muslim. I don't know if that's the case. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I just don't know how that's been. I haven't paid as close attention as I probably should have in that respect. For Christians, it's uh, it's better. Thirty seconds. <laughs> uh, I'd affirm much of what what Far uh, laid out. Um, I think the and it's important not to say. Listen, the personal matters. The example the president sets for the country matters. And it will have uh, policy implications. Like, like there is, you know, I've just been thinking this last week. Um, 
there was an entire wave of folks during the Clinton impeachment scandal who just said, never again, never are we going to have our politics bring, uh, uh, br lead us to have to explain to our children what sexual acts are and what sexual abuses and sexual manipulation. And after this exertion of religious right influence and 81% of white evangelicals voting him in, it's led to Stormy Daniels. It's led to what we're dealing with now. Um, and that, 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 isn't just, that isn't just a, oh, sh shucks, the, the, like, th th that has real uh, implications for family formation, for how our young people are going to act sexually, for what our, our girls can expect from men in their lives and what men ought to respect from the women in their lives. Um, so we could talk about, and there are policy decisions this administration, and the family separation policy is going to be something in the history books that we're going to look back on with the same shame as internment, um, as uh, Jim Crow. Uh, I mean, it, it, that is a, um, uh, you gave me 30 seconds. So there, if anyone else wants to ask questions, we could do that. But uh, I'll, I'll end with a stat. And this one is circulated quite a bit. Um, uh, evangelicals used to be the, 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 the guardians of the idea for exactly what Farr has laid out, which is that you can't separate personal morality from public efficacy, from, from what it means. You can't be a good leader in public and be a corroded person inside. It's just the, the human nature doesn't work that way. And so in 2011, something like, uh, only 30% of white evangelicals would have affirmed the idea that a candidate could have a moral or ethical failure in their personal life and still be uh, uh, an effective public leader. In 2016, that number shot up to 72%. Well, what changed? Did scripture change? Did some new moral teaching come, come out that revolutionized the Christian faith to say different? No, Donald Trump was a Republican nominee. And so, so the standard had to change. They weren't willing to say, well, character's still important, but in a prudential decision between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, we have to make, no, it was, character doesn't matter anymore. Well, thank you so much. I have one question here. So this is gonna open up, first of all, let's thank our guests for being here. And I have a, a question from Peter Fever. So we got to ask this question. Right, yeah. Peter? Um, so this, this will start our audience questions, Q&A, if, if you will. Uh, Michael, you are basically a good left of center, center Democrat and far. You are basically... You should tell more Democrats that, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> a good right of center independent. No, you say he, left. I, I, think he, I asked him more, more uh, accurate. Okay. He, he said it, what he is. <laughs> However, you have millions who claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ in America who would place themselves perhaps further right than you and definitely further right than you. Do you expect to spend eternity with those brothers and sisters in Christ? What is the political conviction that they hold most passionately that makes you second guess your own. Put another way, if you accept the possibility you are on, you, you are wrong on something where they are right, what is the issue you think that is most likely to be the case? Who wants to take it first? Home team. We needed that one in advance. That requires some yeah. <laughs> puzzling. Well, I mean, he's, you know, Political science, public policy professor. Yeah, oh, I don't have. I, I, I have great confidence that uh, that there will that that brothers and sisters with whom I have deep and fundamental disagreements about political issues um, are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is because I don't have confidence for myself, but for the mercy of God, and I'm. I think all the evidence suggests in Jesus's life and in the witness of the church that his mercy is pretty extraordinary. Not to be taken for granted and uh, 
uh, treated presumptuously, but extraordinary. It gives us a lot of hope for all of us. Um, I um, uh, very practically um, an issue that um, boy, that's hard. It's a hard question because, as I've told many people, when they say, "Oh, you just think you're right," that's the problem with you conservatives. Which, I'm, in my world, I'm definitely seen as conservative. You just think you're right, and no one, and, and you have the lock on the truth. And I said, that's true. I think of all of us, because if we didn't think we were right, we would change our mind. And so, um, it's hard to know what policy that I disagree with that I think maybe I'm. Uh, you know, I really might agree with the other, except to say that there's, I think there's, there are certainly areas of ambiguity. I'll be on, one, for example, immigration policy. I think what, what happened is separating families is exquisitely and obviously unreasonable, uh, it seems to me. Um, and, but how do you form an immigration policy right. that Christians can think they can get behind in a broken world um, it seems to me really challenging. A similar one is actually um, how do we do economic policy and the redistribution of wealth um, in a way that uh, is uh, that is just. Um, I don't think a strictly free market works. I mean, it seems lots of evidence that it it, it actually doesn't work to to foster justice. And yet we know that the attempts to redistribute wealth on large scale have often led to greater tyranny and, and ultimately made everybody suffer. So those are kinds of areas where I just, it seems like the political, the political choices require prudential judgment that is difficult to obtain. And I don't think I have any presumption of having myself. Yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of... Uh, I think to think that political differences are going to be the uh, the demarcation is is actually by definition political uh, an idolatry of politics, and so I I mean my my career has been about pushing back on on that kind of notion. Um, in terms of areas where I disagree, I'd say well first of all I want to say. A lot of Christians who are far to my left, and I hear from them often. Uh, and so, you know, w with them, the biggest critique that I sometimes, uh, th th that I think I might be wrong on, and actually this is a critique that uh, this is an area where I disagreed. I didn't have decision-making over national security issues in the White House, but Howard Watts would probably disagree with my general temperament on these things, which is more like a neighbor. Um, but questions of uh, qu question of war and peace and military intervention and just the use of violence at all that, that there are there are um, uh, I often think I may be wrong on on that. My view has tended to be that the state is endowed with um, uh, very particular duties that sometimes mean under just war theory, but but. Uh, there are a lot of liberal Christians who want who, who think just war theory is too pro-war. <laughs> uh, that's too, um, and so I, I think I may be wrong with that. With conservatives, it's not you know. So you know, when you say uh, I'm definitely left of center, a Democrat on economics, and I'm I'm definitely, uh, um, uh, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm pro-life and uh, uh, pro-religious freedom. So you know that that, that those are kind of big. Big uh, demarcation. So I guess the area of difference with with Christians more conservative than I would be um, uh, that I'm open to, and that, that that I think I may be wrong on is like maybe I maybe th those issues really are the issues on which all things must turn. And I'm, I'm open to thinking that that I, I might be that I'll look back and say, um, uh, you know, with with the benefit of of history, that actually uh, issues of the environment, issues of uh, nuclear nonproliferation, issues of immigration, issues of poverty uh, really didn't, uh, re didn't match up to uh, sort of social issues. Again, I, I hold a different position, but, but I could envision a history in which, uh, or I could envision a future in which I look back and say, yeah, I probably, maybe I was wrong. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience. 
Uh, hello, my name is Brian. I'm a uh, senior at Duke studying uh, global health and economics. Um, I, my question is for, for Michael. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, um, the AND campaign. So yeah. I actually uh, attended a, a conference that you spoke at called Praxis this past <laughs> summer. And, Fantastic. Um, wanted to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on the AND campaign. Um, and then also want to hear specifically how um, your faith in Jesus uh, motivates your views on social justice yeah. and uh, especially in economic realms. Yeah, great. So, uh, so Praxis was like a test run for my joining the AND campaign. So you got like a preview and now it's, my, it's a real thing. So I joined an organization called the AND campaign about six weeks ago officially as their chief strategist. And it is a uh, Christian political education and advocacy organization. And I really think of our work as having sort of two sort of mission fields. One is helping Christians think and act Christianly in politics. And then number two, advocating sort of externally for better policies, better candidates, and a healthier political culture. So I'm excited about it. I think it's a fresh expression of, um, of what Christian political engagement will, uh, can look like in an environment where I think there are few organizations and few voices filling that void, many of which are in that space, are not healthy in my view, and others of which are just burdened down by uh, decades of history and being through all kinds of various fights that um, new institutions are needed. So Ann Campaign hopes to be part of an ecosystem of uh, a fresh Christian exp expression of what faithful uh, 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 faithful uh, political engagement looks like. But, but for those who don't know, and this is a segue to the second part of your question, and campaign basically refers to this idea that for so long Christian conversation has separated, you know, there are Christians who are uh, committed to the Bible and have a high view of scripture and um, are orthodox, and then there are Christians uh, who are involved in social activism and social justice. And the AND campaign says no, both orthodoxy and orthopraxy uh, are important, that it's actually both and. Um, and, and so uh, it, a, a few things happen. I, I'd say uh, my faith in Jesus and learning more and more about the Christ, Christian tradition has given me a sense, I think, would help a, that a lot of, a lot of younger uh, activists oriented towards social justice are missing, which is the fact that I'm not just advocating for a point of view, I think uh, justice reflects the heart of God. That justice isn't just about advancing some political program. That it's not just, it's not just about it's the right people attaining power and doing, well, that justice is actually about the God of justice who's moving towards us. Justice, uh, I have a section in my book about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, which is now like a trope in our politics. But MLK was quoting, first of all, it wasn't MLK's quote. He was quoting a pastor who, who used that phrase almost a century earlier. And in context, it's very clear King is not talking about even the Civil Rights Act, as important as that was. King is talking about the fact that we worship a Lord who uh, was struck down by an empire but came to rise back so that King says, so that even, uh, uh, even history is dated by Jesus' name, not Caesar's. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's given me, you know, informed by Walter Storff, informed by King, informed by Howard Thurman, it's given me a, um, a, it's given me a, a place to stand on that isn't just sort of the, the culture and the whims of, of the age, um, which I think is helpful for being involved in justice work in the long term. It's it's a it's a uh, buffet against cynicism, which um, I think is going to be a temptation for a lot of a lot of folks. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm a first year law student at Duke. Um, so, my question, kind of for both of you, actually, is: It seems like people talk past each other a lot in politics. They're not really quite willing to engage the best form of each other's arguments. So, um, in each of your experience, I guess with each of your sides of the aisle or political crowd, um, what would you say the most common misunderstanding mm. of a biblical worldview is, where people aren't willing to engage the true form of that biblical worldview? Mm. So, um, it's 
a great question. I think a common misunderstanding of a biblical worldview or, as I'd rather put it myself, a, a, the Christian tradition is that it is um, oriented toward fulfilling mandates of God um, apart from the question of what is genuinely good for and let, conducive to the flourishing of people. And so I think the truer way of understanding the Christian tradition is that it's an account of uh, what Christians purport to be the truth about who God is, mm. about what we are as human beings, about what our nature and end is, um, how we genuinely flourish. And therefore, God's law is not there as a, uh, an external constraint on our individual freedom and authentic development, but is a gift of revelation to us about the truth, about how we can authentically develop and find our freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think of Paul saying that, uh, you know, we're going to be slaves to, to uh, right, 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 right. basically to, to something. Um, and that uh, slavery to Christ is genuine freedom. Yeah. And that's, 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 on, that's what I see mostly. I'd say what I worry about among Christians is the misunderstanding, um, is the notion that, that a biblical worldview is... Uh, whatever we load into that. Often the term a biblical worldview among Christians is invoked in a way just to affirm something that people um, are committed to at that point. It's not necessarily biblical. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And actually my answer is similar, so I'm just going to kind of rephrase what, what Farr said to say... Um, It's hard for, we, we live in, you know, so it's like a thousand pages if you care to read it, read it but Charles Taylor's book on a secular age is really important work. And what, what Taylor points out, and Jamie Smith, who's a philosopher up at Kelvin, has, has elaborated and made it democratize Taylor's ideas a bit. Um, what uh, my side of the aisle, and frank, frankly, it's just an American, it's a condition of modernity, which is this idea that religion is at best a set of cultural traditions and folklore um, that is uh, handed down, but as far said, actually doesn't testify to any sort of reality and actually doesn't even grant the religious person the dignity of, uh, of uh, uh, admitting that they think it testifies to a reality. And this is why, like, the idea of religious conscience is so difficult for people to understand because they just don't understand. Well, religion is is uh, getting your baby baptized or going to church on Sunday, but it's not. It, it, it's 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 what you do on Sundays. It has nothing to do with everything else, and that's a major misunderstanding that is important across religious traditions. And so, you know, you have this. Um, uh, you have this embrace of religious minorities in some quarters, some political quarters, but they're actually treated like, like an ethnic minor, minority. In other words, it's you're an aid to diversity in this country, or you're an aid to, but we actually don't take your, actual, your religion claim seriously. Like, like we, we don't think your religiosity is a benefit to the nation. Uh, you just add to, <laughs> add to diversity. And that's, that's a really dangerous dangerous place to to be and so i think that's a fundamental core issue are we at least going to grant religious people the dignity of taking their claims at face value and then having a conversation about that and how it ought to bear on on decisions that are made in politics or, or culturally we have time for one more question oh you guys make it hard for me okay Hey, thanks for your talks, both hey. of you. My name is Aisha. I am a dual master's student, both at the Divinity School and at the Sanford School for Public Policy. And um, my question is, is about race. Um, there was an important article that came out. Um, in fact, it was on CNN around the time that Roy Moore, um, the Roy Moore election happened in Alabama, and it talked about how African Americans are the other set of value voters that are often invis invisibilized and um, not discussed. I'm sorry, I'm a little sick. Um, 
And so my question is about the rise of, of white nationalism um, cloaked in, in kind of Christian patriotism um, that has been more and more prevalent since the election of Donald Trump. And what is at stake when, in fact, when we're discussing reasons why people voted for, for Donald Trump, we're not even willing to enter race into that conversation as a, as a salient reason. Yeah. What's, at, what's, at, what's at stake for the church as the church is actually continuing to heal from the ways that race has been weaponized in our history? So I think to the extent there is a single salient issue, I mean, all you have to do is look at the numbers. I mean, so uh, the only reason why 81%, why it's, why it's thought of that 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump is because white's in front of them. You look at the evangelical vote overall, and it's, it's much different. It's much more nuanced. And it's actually race. Like if you break down the electorate by religion, uh, it was much different. The most determinative factor in people's vote was, was race. And there are all kinds of things tied up in that. Um, all kinds of political strategies and political decisions dating back to the Southern strategy and before that, obviously, but then uh, also decisions the Democratic Party has made, decisions the modern Republican Party has made, the fact that Trump ran a campaign that uh, explicitly exploited racial divides. Um, and so I, I think it's very salient. What I'm concerned about as a Christian is the way that Christianity has provided safe harbors for racism and xenophobia um, in a way that we have, uh, have gone unexamined and in some cases intentionally unexamined and in, in yet other cases explicitly embraced. And those are things that we need to confront uh, that I think in some quarters are being confronted. I'm encouraged by um, people like Beth Moore, people like Russell Moore, um, who have been tackling this the best they can within the context in which they work. Um, uh, I work for an organization that's um, that's black led that is rooted in the black church that is explicitly trying to tackle this on uh, in a, multi a multitude of communities and it's it's uh, it's it's uh, I think it's I think it breaks the heart of God mm -hmm. because it is such a um, it is such a uh, it, it undermines our witness and who we say we worship. Mm -hmm. And so it's not going anywhere. Uh, and we need to face it head on. So I think you're absolutely right. I, I should say Michael's uh, notes in, in the, toward the end of the book that uh, race is sort of the central issue that um, Christians have got to keep wrestling with. I have had point in my life uh, personally where I become aware that I'm recognizing, so picking up on the earlier question, that I was ignorant in important ways that sometimes culpably ignorant um, um, to that point, and now I see something anew, and I wonder what the next stage for that is. But one of, uh, one of those has been, a few of those have been with respect to race, um, and one of those has been in the last few years, here I'm 47 years old, um, just starting to do the work of um, reading the history of um, the ways that uh, blacks in the U.S. have been disenfranchised um, economically. I was, I was aware of the, the violence, but, but the economic disenfranchisement in, in things like the uh, housing and urban development policies and the, the GI Bill and, and, and FHA and so on. Um, and that's just one little piece of the story. So I think I, I am somewhat encouraged as well that I think Christians are, um, I, I see at least many Christians um, wanting to, uh, wanting to, to learn what they, recognizing they haven't learned adequately and wanting to find a new way forward. But it is a, you know, the, the, the great, I will say, close with this. We said that Christianity transcends politics. If there's, if this issue is, is the one that can help us most remember that the 
that America is not a chosen people. Uh, mm-hmm. This is not a chosen nation. Um, there has never been a great time in the past uh, that we can go back to in the U.S. that didn't have this glaring uh, and massive injustice being perpetrated by uh, and, and in which Christians were complicit. So I think it's just a helpful check on folks on conservatives' uh, uh, desire for something in the past um, because, you know, what year do you go back to um, where you don't find um, racism being uh, a glaring sin? Michael Ware, Dr. Parker Owen. You've been listening to The Road to Hope, a special RTN theology in coordination with the Center for Christianity and Scholarship at Duke University. I'd like to thank its director, Edward Dixon, for co-writing this episode, as well as Peter D. Fever, professor of political science and public policy at Duke University and the director of the Duke Program in American Grand Strategy. As always, I'd like to thank Jeff Crawford for his wisdom and guidance with regard to the audio. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to listen to any of the previous RTN Theologies or any Road to Now episodes, please visit theroadtonow.com. I'm Bob Crawford. Until next time, take care.